Last spring, a third-party investigation commissioned by the Clark Schools for the Hearing and Speech into alumni allegations of past abuse at the school in Northampton wrapped up. And that's when Daily Hampshire Gazette reporter Dusty Christensen got to work. He delved into details of who was impacted, what went wrong, and how the school is responding to the events that took place during the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. Christensen spoke with me about his six-month-long investigation and reaction since it was published over the weekend. Largely, the reaction has been one of, of sadness, uh, as well as appreciation for having uncovered uh, what I think a lot of people in uh, the Clark community and, and alumni have known about for years and years, but yeah. sort of exposing it to the, the wider community. The school itself had done an, an internal investigation led by, or excuse me, put into the hands of a third party. That's right. Um, that report came out in April, which your paper reported on, Daily Hampshire Gazette. But that report wasn't widely released. Right. How did you guys get access to it? So we actually got access to it because a uh, former Northampton City Councilor, Mike Kirby, uh, who runs uh, his own news blog, uh, published it on, on his own website. I, I suppose somebody had leaked the uh, report to him. He published it, and, and we moved on from there and did our own reporting on, on that independent investigation that right they had released in April. And so what is outlined in um, your primary piece of reporting, and then you also have two secondary pieces, that 16 people spoke with you, 12 on the record, and as you said, detailed abuses during the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And I want to quote from uh, part of your reporting, and it says, quote, staff banishing a five-year-old to a dark basement with no explanation, whipping seven-year-olds with a belt, beating students' hands with brushes and rulers if they used sign language or gesture, punching and then strangling a 16-year-old on a ping-pong table. I mean, it's just very gruesome and graphic accounts that were detailed to you. Many of those people didn't speak for that internal investigation that took place for, with this school. How did you get people to speak with you? So actually, uh, the reporting that uh, ultimately came out in, in this uh, report last week uh, came to us largely after we had reported initially on that investigation the school released in April. Uh, we had alumni come uh, out of the woodwork to say, you know, this is great that you're reporting on this independent investigation, uh, but it doesn't begin to scratch the surface of what our realities were as students there at Clark in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Uh, so of course we started talking to one person and that would lead to another person, and as word spread that we were doing this story, more alumni began uh, to come forward and we went through the process of interviewing them, verifying their accounts, uh, and that they indeed were students at Clark, um, and uh, then obviously reaching out to the school as well as sort of providing the broader context of what this all meant uh, during that time period. Yeah, because there have been a lot of changes there at the campus in addition right. to a name change. It's no longer a boarding school, That's it's right. only a day school. Um, but looking looking at this, you know, in some of the cases, the allegations um, of this abuse, 70 years old in some cases, you know, were the students unable to communicate the abuses at that time, or where did this come from? In some cases, yes. I think it depends uh, student to student. Some uh, alumni who spoke to us said that they, uh, they did communicate uh, with their parents, for example, about the abuse that they faced. Uh, some of them called the administration to express uh, anger or frustration. Some people maybe pulled their kids out. Some parents didn't believe uh, their children when they told them about this. Um, so they were largely ignored. Uh, yes, and then, you know, some uh, some students, uh, some alumni, I should say, uh, said that while they were students, they didn't really have the uh, language skills to be able to effectively communicate about their uh, the abuse that they were, they say they were facing, uh, to their parents. Uh, Clark uh, was an oralist school that meant they taught uh, uh, spoken English and lip reading and to, not to deaf students to deaf students deaf yeah. and hard of hearing students that's right uh, and did not teach American Sign Language um, and uh, as a result a lot of these uh, deaf students that spoke to us for this report said they felt like they didn't have the communication skills to even begin to describe the kind of uh, depression or anxiety uh, and, and abuses that they had faced at the school because of that communication method that the school thought. And also put it in context for the times, right? You can't use, you don't have Skype or any sort of video calling right. whatsoever. So even if they were attempting to communicate uh, over they had the to phone. Do so through a teacher. Yeah, through a teacher, through someone else, or maybe writing. And then the students were only going home four times a year, right? That's right. Uh, not all students, but, but students who lived far away, right? They would only go home to visit on, on breaks.
And so this, this tradition of oralism, which was eventually adopted across the country for a large period of time, right. as your reporting points out, it really originated at Clark or was used primarily at Clark, right? Uh, yes, I mean, Clark definitely plays a uh, very important role in the uh, sort of founding of and eventual spread across the country of, of oralism, this philosophy that focuses on lip reading uh, and spoken English. Um, uh, and with the sort of spread of oralism across the country came uh, a campaign to eliminate manualism or sign language. Uh, and, uh, you know, obviously a lot of the alumni who spoke to us, ha all of them now speak ASL. Uh, m almost all of them as their primary language and are deeply resentful of the experience of having that language denied to them during their formative years. Um, you know, especially the, the deaf alumni who spoke to us said that you know, they weren't able to communicate effectively until they started learning ASL. They weren't able to, uh, and at school, because they spent so much time on, on lip reading and, and trying to learn to speak when they couldn't even hear what they were saying, that they weren't able to focus on their passions like art history or other subjects that once they went to college, they were able to focus on. And it was really, oralism eventually was seen as, as an abusive tactic, right? Uh, yeah, and it, you know, it sort of fell out of favor as the civil rights era came and went and uh, the deaf community began uh, pushing back and, and advocating for uh, more use of, of American Sign Language in, in education. Um, Clark played a, a pretty pivotal role in uh, the early years of oralism and spreading it across the country. Uh, and uh, a sort of central figure in Clark's history was the inventor Alexander Graham Bell. Uh, he met his wife, uh, who was a student at the school uh, at Clark. Uh, and uh, his uh, wife's father uh, was eventually uh, the first president uh, of the Bell Telephone Company. Um, and he would travel throughout the Midwest uh, speaking to schools and governments uh, advocating the use of oralism. Uh, Bell was, like others at the time, uh, a eugenicist. He believed uh, that deaf people should not socialize together, should not marry and have children, mm. uh, because he thought that that would be a way to eradicate deafness. But of course, the deaf community, uh, especially the signing deaf community nowadays, uh, views Bell quite negatively because of that and because of his belief right, that, that deaf people shouldn't socialize together. For its part, the school, how have they responded to your reporting? Uh, the school has uh, expressed, uh, they expressed in the April report that they released through the third party law firm, uh, deep remorse over the abuse that had, that had taken place at the school decades ago. Uh, and in speaking to me, that was the same sentiment. They, they acknowledged those past abuses and expressed uh, uh, sincere apologies about it. Uh, they say that Clark is a very different place nowadays. Uh, for one, as you mentioned earlier, it's, it's no longer a residential school. Uh, they operate day schools in five cities uh, on the East Coast. Um, and they say they one have a North very- One in Northampton and one in Boston for Massachusetts. That part. is correct, that is correct. One in Northampton and one in Boston. Um, they, uh, they say that nowadays they have a zero tolerance policy for uh, any sort of abuse. Um, and as far as sort of their educational model nowadays, they still don't teach American Sign Language, uh, but they say that technology, uh, the advances in technology uh, with uh, digital hearing aids and cochlear implants uh, allow them to mainstream deaf and hard of hearing students into their neighborhood schools at much earlier ages and have much more success uh, with spoken English. And what about the alum, um, the alums that you spoke with, their reaction to the school's response? Uh, they were largely unimpressed with the uh, apology uh, that, uh, and the accompanying third party report that was released in April. Uh, they said it didn't begin to describe the, the totality of their experiences. Uh, the school, after we contacted them uh, requesting an interview, uh, established a, a limited fund for victims of physical or psychological abuse. Uh, they say it has nothing to do with us reaching out uh, to them for an interview uh, and to let them know about our story. Um, and alumni felt, some of the alumni we spoke to felt like it was too little too late. I mean, some of these people are already in their 70s, have had to go to therapy for years uh, because of the abuse that they faced, and think that this is, it, it's just too late.
Is there any, have you heard any concerns from parents of current students now that they've heard these allegations that took place years ago? I have not. And, you know, as part of our reporting, we also uh, published a story about Clark Today in which I spoke to a parent who has a student at Clark Philadelphia nowadays uh, who expressed great appreciation for the school's uh, educational programs uh, as well as their sort of early childhood intervention. You know, uh, a lot of deaf children are born to hearing parents who have no idea about the educational opportunities available to them. Uh, this particular parent said uh, she was very appreciative of, of Clark walking her through what options were available to her and uh, getting her son started in the process of getting a cochlear implant, going to Clark's uh, preschool, and then later on being integrated into the same neighborhood school that his brothers are attending.